Hello, everybody. It is a great pleasure to be with you for this introduction to uh, the World Heritage Framework and to be a part of this uh, splendid work that uh, RIVAC is doing. Uh, my name is Ruben Grima. I am from the University of Malta. And in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to try to introduce some of the fundamental ideas and mechanisms of the World Heritage Framework. Now, to look at the roots of the concept of World Heritage, a good place to begin is the foundation of UNESCO itself, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, which like the mother organization, the United Nations, is created in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. And in this short quote from the constitution of UNESCO, already in 1945, there's this important idea that because wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. And this fundamental idea, which you also see in, in, in this quote, also from the constitution, that the challenge is that ignorance of each other's, meaning other cultures, ways and lives has been a common cause throughout history of the suspicion and mistrust between the peoples of the world to which their differences have all too often broken into war. And those words are as true today, tragically, as they were in 1945. And the idealism that we see in the foundation of UNESCO to use education, science and culture as instruments of peace is still very much a need and a valuable vision today. The World Heritage Convention is one of the great expressions of this vision. The thinking develops during the 1960s and uh, there are many readings on, on its evolution and the convention in the form we know it today as an international instrument to celebrate both the greatest achievements of humanity and the wonders of the natural world was formulated and launched in 1972. And uh, we are soon going on to the 50th anniversary. It's going to be half a century very soon. And it is one of the most popular of the UNESCO conventions. Currently, you have well over a thousand sites in 167 countries, uh, mostly cultural, but also a growing number of natural and mixed properties. I must emphasize that there's a wonderful online resource. The uh, UNESCO World Heritage Center website is not simply a website. It is a great resource center where this interactive map, for instance, allows you to explore each site, you can navigate around the world, and then you can look up all the background documents related to each site. And you can see the spread, the global spread, and the popularity of the convention. You can also see certain imbalances. You can see this massive concentration in Europe, while some other parts of the world have a much more sparse density of world heritage, partly because of the uneven distribution of humanity on the globe, because of climatic and environmental factors, but also because of uneven resources. And I'll refer to this again later. Now, zooming in on Europe, you can see, and the more you zoom in, the more sites you see in Europe. So you can see the, the huge imbalance, for example, between uh, Western Europe, and the surrounding regions like North Africa and Eastern Europe and Asia. Now, 
these are some key terms which will be coming up and which I would like to be in focus by the end. Uh, the um, point I want to make now is about the nomination process. For a site to become a World Heritage Site, it must be nominated by the state party. When we say state party, we mean the country which has signed the World Heritage Convention and is therefore a party to the convention. It is not a group of wise men and women experts in some office somewhere who decide together uh, what from the world should be described as world heritage. The process requires that the nomination comes from the respective country and then there is a filtering process uh, of uh, scrutiny to check whether it does meet the criteria to become world heritage. But the principle that it is the country which nominates is crucial because it involves a commitment. It involves duties, responsibilities, as well as the privilege of being recognized as world heritage. And it is only the country itself which can make voluntarily that commitment. And we'll look through how this process works in a moment as we go through these terms. Uh, when uh, a nomination is made, and in much of the work of the World Heritage Process, it is not only UNESCO which is a player, but there are the advisory bodies, principally three. So uh, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, advises on cultural sites. ICROM, the International Center for Conservation in Rome, uh, the Intergovernmental Center, uh, advises on issues of uh, conservation. And the International Union for the Conservation of Nature advises on natural sites. And these play a crucial role when uh, new nominations for inscription are being scrutinized and even to assess the state of conservation of those sites subsequently. Now, we spoke about the imbalance. Since the 1990s, there has been a great effort in new inscriptions um, by UNESCO to try to achieve a more balanced and representative list. So encouraging countries and cultures and types of sites which are underrepresented to become better represented on the list. Now for a site to be inscribed, it must meet one of these criteria. And these are what embody what is defined as outstanding universal value. And you can see at a glance that the first six of these criteria, such as being a masterpiece of human creative genius, or an outstanding testimony to a cultural tradition or an outstanding example of a type of building. The first six relate to cultural sites and the last four relate to natural sites. And it is these which embody the outstanding universal value of the site. And some of the sites which uh, are inscribed may at first surprise you. What you see here, for instance, is Robin Island the prison where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned for about three decades before the end of apartheid in South Africa. And of course, this is not, we are not celebrating apartheid here with this inscription, but we are remembering something which must never happen again. Likewise, Auschwitz is inscribed on the World Heritage List, not because it in any way celebrates the Holocaust, but to make sure it is never forgotten. And this is where the World Heritage Convention becomes very, very exciting and relevant to issues even today. Now, as I said, states parties enter a responsibility because they have volunteered to safeguard the sites on their territory as uh, world heritage, so they are becoming the stewards on behalf of the world heritage community. And th this is defined in the 1972 convention, but also in the operational guidelines to implement the convention. The text of the 1972 convention cannot be changed. So it is 
a relic of uh, the climate and language in 1972. So naturally, as needs change, we need updated guidelines on how to put the spirit of the convention into practice. And this is done through the operational guidelines, which are updated regularly, even as recently as last year. Now, one of the key responsibilities of the state's party is monitoring. And uh, there is both reactive monitoring and periodic monitoring. Reactive monitoring is in reaction to a problem. So when there is a uh, situation or works are being undertaken, which have an impact on the state of conservation of a property, the state party, possibly with the support of the UNESCO World Heritage Center, must report this. And uh, also, when uh, a site is put on the list in danger, which we'll speak about soon, uh, there must be uh, reporting, reactive reporting, reactive monitoring. And a very important paragraph is paragraph 172 of the operational guidelines, which states that whenever a new project, a major project, whether it's restoration or a new construction, which may affect the outstanding universal value of a property, that the state party must give notice very early on, not when the works begin or are about to begin, but when it is still a plan, when, it's still, when it is still easy to revise those plans. So before a commitment, yeah, the text is very clear and this is very, very important. Periodic monitoring, this uh, again was discussed uh, intensively in the 1990s because it was being done a bit sporadically till then. And from the 1990s, a cycle where uh, the different regions for the purposes of uh, the World Heritage Convention, the different regions of the world report over um, uh, five successive years, sometimes it's extended to six successive years, and then there is a year of reflection. So each region reports one year after another so that the focus is, is on that region. For example, Sub-Saharan Africa or uh, Europe and North America and so forth. And now we are in the third cycle of this reporting where countries assess, yeah, the purpose of this is that countries take a moment to reflect on how well the convention is being implemented and the state of conservation of those sites. And it also encourages ways of strengthening uh, cooperation. Now, we mentioned the list of world heritage in danger. What does it mean to be put on the list of world heritage danger? And uh, of course, in Palestine, this is an important question because of the three inscriptions uh, in uh, Palestine, two are on the list in danger and they have been on the list in danger since their inscription on the World Heritage List. This is very, very particular. As a general rule, the World Heritage Committee does not inscribe sites if the uh, management framework and the safeguarding of these sites is not uh, secured, is not in place. Uh, but in uh, this specific case, because of the very specific circumstances and the specific threats facing these sites, inscription was deemed to be of benefit to help ensure the preservation of these sites. So again, this is where the World Heritage Convention becomes very creative and interesting and relevant to the realities on the ground. And here you can see the distribution of uh, uh, World Heritage Sites in danger. And you can see now a different pattern to the one we saw before. So well, although there is that greatest concentration in Europe, there are very, very few lists, uh, sites in danger in Europe. So you see this imbalance where uh, it is in areas of conflict. Note the concentration in Syria and Iraq. And, and even in Palestine, uh, note the concentration 
in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and even in South America. So there is this uh, imbalance in uh, the, uh, where the threats and the biggest challenges are. And the site can be put on the list in danger for two reasons, either a certain danger or potential danger, something which has already happened or something which is at risk of happening. And all of this you can read online. Now, one of the consequences of being inscribed on the list in danger is that you get more support. So priority is given in the international assistance programs of UNESCO, which can be both, there is a modest, a very modest budget uh, of financial assistance, but more importantly, there is also technical assistance, which uh, UNESCO can mobilize. Uh, and priority is given to the list, uh, to sites on the list in danger. And I want very quickly to tell you two quick stories as examples of uh, uh, what happens when a site is put on the list in danger, taken from a totally different country. They are both taken from Germany in the early 2000s. And one has a happy ending and one has a less happy ending. Cologne Cathedral, inscribed because of its wonderful evolution, uh, in 1996. In 2004, there's a big issue because of the high rise development that is happening across the river from it. And it is put on the list in danger. This is the decision of the committee. You will have the PowerPoint so you can study the detail later. And the, these were where the high rise buildings were planned on this site here. I'll show you a few images of the ones actually built and others that were projected. And uh, because it was put on the list in danger, a discussion began between ICOMOS, UNESCO, and the German government and the municipal government in Cologne. And the outcome of that was that many of the planned high rise was removed, was not done. And uh, uh, this is the new building, which was again, a low rise building instead of a high rise building that was planned. And the net result, uh, although, yes, uh, this is the wording when it was put on the list in danger. Note, it puts, in, puts it in danger, but it immediately is giving guidance on what the country needs to do to address the problem. So to reconsider the current building plans, etc. And this is what happens. There was some negative reaction, but as a, the outcome of that was that there was the decision to remove, only two years later, 2006, Cologne Cathedral is removed from the list in danger. So this is a success story. And everybody is happy and the world heritage of Cologne has been protected. A less happy story also in Germany, uh, only a, a short time later, uh, was the uh, Dresden Elbe Valley, which is a culture landscape. and. The problem was this bridge which was being planned across the River Elbe, which was an important panorama. And note, this is how you see it on the website today, it is struck through. That is already telling you why this is a story without a happy ending, because the outcome of it was that the Dresden Elbe Valley was, and it is only the second time that this uh, happened, uh, a site was struck off the UNESCO World Heritage List. And uh, in July 2008, the World Heritage Committee told Germany that if they continue with this plan to build a bridge, the site will be removed from the World Heritage List. So it gave a very, very strong message. And that happened a year later when they decided to proceed with the bridge. Of course, in Germany, it's a complex situation because you have multiple layers of government. So the uh, city and the state also had a say in the decision apart from Germany. And this was the message from UNESCO and their final outcome that Dresden lost its world heritage status, which of course created a lot of uh, critical debates and even comparison with uh, the Taliban, as you see in this picture and the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas. So the message here is that inscription on the world heritage on the list in danger 
is not some form of penalization. It's not a punishment. It is not a downgrading, but it is a framework of support and solidarity to help the state party address especially difficult challenges. That is what we have time for. That was my 20 minutes, but I'll be delighted if you have questions, if you send them to Rivak and to uh, Mr. Michel Salame, uh, and then the, I'd be happy even to uh, correspond if anybody is interested in the future. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. Thank you.